Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Brian Kaufman in this segment. He's joining us here from the CLL Society. He's also a CLL patient, and he's uh, going to discuss the impact and burden of COVID-19 on immunocompromised patients. Welcome to Health Professional Radio. Dr. Kaufman, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Neil, thank you so much for inviting me. It's my great pleasure. Well, if you would, would you uh, tell our listeners a little bit about your your background, a bit about your uh, professional area of expertise and um, your involvement with the CLL Society and what exactly the CLL Society is? Absolutely. uh, So I'm a retired uh, family uh, doctor uh, whose life was changed uh, 15, 16 years ago when I was diagnosed with CLL chronic lymphocytic leukemia and Uh, CLL comes in all different kinds of flavors, but mine was a very aggressive failure uh, flavor. And it uh, led to needing quick intervention, including uh, an allogeneic uh, stem cell transplant, which didn't work, multiple hospitalizations. And I started to tell my story about it. And my kids were saying to me, Dad, you can't be emailing everybody that's so old school. It would be much Mm -hmm. better if you had a blog or something. So I started a blog. The blog became highly followed, very popular, and that morphed into the CLL Society, which at first was just about support and educating people, but uh, later uh, grew to do a lot more in terms of research and advocacy. There are many types of of immunocompromised patients. Um, Do you think that there are some who are are more at risk uh, being immunocompromised than others within that same community? Uh, A great question. Um, Clearly, there's differences in how the different uh, communities work. My expertise is in the chronic lymphocytic leukemia community, and I'll focus in on that. But what I will tell you is in the blood cancer areas, there are certain people who respond quite well to the vaccines, form good antibodies, and seem to have better results. A number of HIV patients where the disease is well controlled, they're HIV positive but not active AIDS, seem to do quite well. and in the CLL world, even there's a difference. The patients who are in watch and wait or the patients who are a year or more out from therapy and in a deep remission seem to do pretty well with um, vaccinations. But there is a significant number of immunocompromised patients, especially those on B-cell depleting therapies uh, like the monoclonal antibodies, rituximab or obinutuzumab, that uh, really have trouble forming antibodies and don't do very well um, if they're exposed to or um, contact uh, COVID. Um, and CLL patients, and along with some other B-cell lymphoma patients, uh, tend to have among the worst outcomes. What we do know from data out of Israel and um, the U.S. is between 40 and 44 percent of the Breakthrough infections post-vaccination are in the immunocompromised, Mm -hmm. where they only form about 2.7% of the population. So we are a much higher risk for getting COVID, and we're at a much higher risk for worse outcomes. Talk a a little bit about some of the everyday challenges that you face as someone who's immunocompromised and how this pandemic is um, exacerbating some of those challenges on a day-to-day basis. Neil, the biggest issue today in every one of the 39 support groups that I sit in on Mm -hmm. uh, uh, across the U.S. and uh, Canada is our immune compromised state. I get 10 questions on COVID for every one that I get Mm -hmm. related to CLL. Mm -hmm. And CLL has always been recognized as a disease of the immune system. But what patients are facing now is the anxiety and the depression from the isolation. So CLL patients have been very good about masking and about uh, social distancing. Mm -hmm. In an an informal survey we did of over 400 CLL patients, 98% were vaccinated. So an entirely different picture than the general population in the U.S. because we recognize our vulnerability. But most of us are still staying very locked down and the big social events in our lives are maybe going into the pharmacy to pick up our medications or to a doctor's appointment. 
people aren't able to visit with their grandkids, eat at a restaurant, get on an airplane. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety. I see a lot of panic if somebody coughs across the room or even across the street. Mm -hmm. It's it's a uh, it's a very difficult time for the uh, CLL community and other immunocompromised communities. People who have to go to work in high-risk situations are often in a panic state. Is there a, a lack of awareness about the challenges that uh, CLL patients and other immunocompromised patients uh, face? Is there a lack of awareness? Is that included in the obvious unmet needs of this community when, when it comes to uh, just the everyday challenges and this pandemic as well? Lack of awareness is critical on two sides. First is it's incumbent for us uh, at the CLL Society and other uh, nonprofits and, and also for the healthcare community to let patients know, as the CDC guidelines say, uh, uh, um, and to, I summarize those as our mantra is get immunized but act as if you're not because there's been tragedies reported where patients with immune compromised states like CLL have been fully immunized and thought I can finally, I can go to the grocery store and go shopping. I don't have to wear a mask. I can have a beer out with my friend wrong. If they get, they're much higher risk to get COVID. And if they do get COVID, they're much uh, higher risk for succumbing to the disease. So there's that education we have to do of the patients themselves that, so that they're aware um, a study out of the United Kingdom uh, showed that almost 90% of patients with blood cancers were not aware that the vaccine was not protective for them like it was for the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. The other piece of this is that the when someone wears a mask, they're protecting themselves to a certain extent, but they're also protecting the immunocompromised to sometimes an even greater extent. Because we can do everything, but we're much more vulnerable, we're much more easy to infect, and we're much more likely to have these bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we're dependent on the kindness of strangers, the masks of others, and trying to get that word out um, to the community at large to say, you're wearing the mask to protect me. Sure, if you get COVID and you're 20 years old, you're probably going to do fine. But if you're a 70-year-old CLL patient, you know, you don't odds may not be nearly as good. I heard you mention uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies, and I also heard you mention the, um, the, the possibility of being unable to mount the proper immune response because of your uh, immunocompromised status. Uh, what is your understanding and knowledge of a, of a long-acting long antibody therapy that's currently under review by the FDA for potential emergency use authorization here in the United States? Monoclonal antibodies are used in many settings, and they've revolutionized the care in uh, many uh, blood cancers, including uh, CLL. Um, but monoclonal antibodies are being repurposed here uh, to attack the um, uh, uh, or prevent infection uh, with the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. And for CLL patients, there's the analogy I like to draw is if you have a type 1 diabetic that can't make insulin, you can't, you, you don't give them drugs to slap around their pancreas. You, you, you give them insulin and that's how you keep them alive. Well, a lot of blood cancer patients and immunocompromised patients and patients on B-cell depleting therapies can't make antibodies. So you can give them all the vaccines, but if you check their antibody level, they have none or they have very weak responses, even with uh, third shots, even with four shots I, from anecdotes I hear from patients. So, but fortunately, there's another option. We can give them monoclonal antibodies that have been proven in battle, antibodies that have been taken from patients who have done well and recovered robustly from a COVID infection. And by mixing a couple antibodies together that, have, that attach to non-overlapping areas of the spike protein, 
we're able to provide this passive immunity, almost a passive vaccination to people who can't get that immunity actively on their own. So this is game changing. Um, right now, um, I was in a clinical trial of um, one such antibody, um, AZD7442, which is a simple injection in, in the gluteus maximus, two injections, one of the antibody in one cheek, the other antibody in the other cheek. And because of its very prolonged half-life, the thought is that this will offer maybe as long as a year, six months, nine months of protection. Mm-hmm. So. This would provide for the immunocompromised community a level of protection um, similar to that's offered by vaccination in the immunocompetent community. Well, Brian, where can our listeners go and learn some more about the CLL Society and about some of these uh, therapies that uh, may offer some some hope to the community? Um, uh, Neil, thanks for that question. Uh, CLLsociety.org. Um, all one word, clsociety.org, is a 5013 nonprofit, uh, and uh, we're easy to find on the website. Uh, our, our website will guide you to all kinds of articles, not only on monoclonal antibodies, but on CLL and its treatment and management, our support groups, uh, free second opinions for patients, um, all, all kinds of tremendous uh, resources. It's all physician curated, but it's patient directed, and it's a great resource uh, for patients with CLL to try to help them understand their disease, especially in this trying time with the pandemic. Dr. Kaufman, I appreciate you joining us here this evening and sharing. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Neil, it was my uh, great pleasure, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you for helping get the word out about this important problem that I think, as your questions intimated, is under-recognized. But there is a solution at hand, and I'm extremely optimistic that once we get this authorized and then get it into the people that will benefit from it, um, we're going to see a different world for the immunocompromised, that world that opens up just like the world has opened up for the immunocompetent it will open up for CLL patients like myself. I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get an opportunity to speak again. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Brian Kaufman, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of the CLL Society. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com health professional radio.